Lord, we praise and magnify you today. Have your way in here, Holy Spirit. I pray to each and every person under the sound of my voice, Lord Jesus, as we come to you and we take your yoke upon us, that you relieve us and deliver us from the heaviness and the weights of this world, the things that we are burdened by, that as we come to you, Lord, that you will give us rest for our souls. We receive that by faith. Lord, I receive it right now. I thank you that you've called me to minister, to preach, and to teach your word. I thank you for the miracles that you've given me, done for me. I thank you for saving my soul and that it's an ongoing process. I'm so grateful to you, Lord. Have my voice that it might build up and edify those that hear and glorify you in Jesus' name. Somebody say, Amen. praise God. Praise God. You may be seated or you can stand. It doesn't matter to me. Praise the Lord. I want to continue to build on what the Lord has been putting in my heart about um, kind of the, 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 the topic, if I could, could identify it in one word or point to one word, is balance. And, and then what scriptures the Lord has been using to kind of, um, gosh, the word kind of in God, <laughs> I, that was all of me because God is not a kind of God. He's a kind God, but he's not like, well, he's kind of. So that's the Holy Spirit. Uh, thank you for that instruction and correction in righteousness. Righteousness. I want to build on that as it pertains to us having a balance point. How many of you um, have been in a position uh, physically, mentally, uh, financially, anything that you have found yourself out of balance, right? I, I want to kind of point a little bit more direction uh, to the mental part of being out of balance. And the prayer that I prayed uh, as I, the Holy Spirit prodded me this morning was, was out of uh, Matthew 11, and I'm just going to give you some, uh, some of this tasty word here. Uh, I believe it's so important why we, why we, everybody's heard of the gospel, right? It's so important why we should have a revelation or, or an understanding about who Jesus is, why he came, and what the gospel really is. So gospel, as you look up that word, uh, it's literally it's translated good news. But it's, what's more important is to understand good news about what. So scripture is, for us, God speaking to us. Uh, the gospel that he speaks is good news, but it's the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace, which I preach, Paul said. Grace. It's this good news that Jesus came, died, rose again, that we might have reconciliation with the Father as we believe on Jesus in our heart. Jesus said, I won't leave you alone. I'll send for you another, a helper, a counselor, a guide, somebody that would give us direction, something that this power that comes from on high that is equal to God and Jesus, the Holy Spirit. He said, I'll leave you with the Holy Spirit. See, when you're led by the Spirit, this is what Jesus was ministering about when he said, the sheep know my voice. He said, I'm the good shepherd and the sheep know my voice. The reason we get out of balance in our thought life is that we're listening to the wrong voices, right? We're listening to our voice based on the things that we see outside in, a circumstance which can change, but we think that that is our truth and we meditate and marinate because we can see it, touch it, feel it, think it. Thoughts can actually, as you think on them enough, can really, they can raise the hair on the back of your neck. You, you, they, can, they can freeze you, uh, paralyze you with, with fear. That's what, how these thoughts are. So when we get caught up in that, it's like we can't hear the frequency or the voice of the shepherd. So Jesus ministered this in uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. 
starts with just beautiful direction. He says, come to me. Come to me. That word, come, it's the same, it's the same word that he, he said to Peter when Peter was seeing Jesus walking on the water. He said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. And all Jesus said was, come. He didn't say, hey, I, I know you're going to lose your faith in a little bit. Let's just skip the process, teach you a little bit more. I know you're about to sink. No, he's, he's always willing. And so he says it here. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Oh, that's so good. This yoke, uh, the image that I got, I don't know what you get, but I, I was thinking back in those days that how they would how they would plow, right? They'd have this big, powerful ox, like kind of short and stocky like me, but um, had more power. And the, you know, they would the 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 the, they would have this wood plow with a piece of iron on, you know, at the end of a, uh, you know, it looks like a candy cane. And, and then they would strap that to this ox, but then the, the, the guy behind it, you know, the farmer would be, would, would have the reins. But see, what, what's interesting about that is the yoke is this, this big thing that goes around the ox's neck, right? So the ox has a lot of power, but if it's not harnessed, it can't be transferred to the plow and can't be guided and directed by the plowman. So good. It's so good, right? So Jesus is saying, my yoke, take it upon me. See, he, it's, the, the Bible says that he's a power on high, right? The, I, I love how the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I used to struggle with that because I would be thinking about the emotion that joy produces, not the power that it is, right? So how God is always joyful. The, the Psalms, the psalmist says, let the Lord be magnified who takes pleasure in your prosperity. I shared this last week in a different way, but God, he, he is joyful, and he is, he's brought pleasure when you are brought to a place of increase. And Jesus is saying right here, this is how you do it. Come to me. Come to me. Take my yoke upon you. It literally means be joined to. Be joined to. I, I've had some times in my life where, whoo, it's like, just cannot everybody see this? And I'd be saying that on the coattails of God revealing something to me. I've had it happen like in a public place. Like I, it felt so surreal. The busyness of life was just going on and God was just speaking to my heart. I'm like, whoa, how can you not see this? And I've had times in my prayer closet where it was like that too. Wonderful, and I used to think just like Jesus being on the mount and then going another level up and being transfigured, that's how I felt. It's like the glory of God was around me. But we don't spend most of our time, at least I don't, in that realm. A lot of it's in the valley. Just like when Jesus came down, he had to deal with some devils. He had to deal with some arguing. He had to deal with these religious leaders talking to a man who had hope that this Jesus and these disciples could deliver his son. And all this chaos was going on about spiritual stuff. And that is often where we live. So it's important to remember that little sliver, this small times where you have that presence where he can download, oh, in such a concentrated form. Such a concentrated form. But see, if we're not having those moments, it doesn't mean that God isn't wanting to have those. It doesn't mean that you're deficient. It just means that there's a process in which we grow just like a child. See, Jesus wasn't the only one resurrected. Yes, he's the only man that died and came to life again as it's described in Scripture for us and what the purpose of that was to us. But see, the Scripture says that we were resurrected. Let me, let me explain. Once I was lost, but then I was found, right? So when we were born into this world, we were born into this sinful world with a sinful nature. When a person comes of age to the point where they can start recognizing the pull of God on their heart, there's something that happens on the inside that you start to answer the question Jesus asks, who am I? 
Who do you say that I am? And all of a sudden, we start going, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. In Romans 10 comes alive. We believe in our heart that there's a God. We believe that he sent his son for us. And with the mouth, we confess the Lord Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes in and salvation is ours. That's the resurrection moment. See, you were spiritually dead, but then you became spiritually alive. The Bible says that you become a new creation, a spiritual creation. You become a living spirit. Well, wasn't I alive before? You were, but now you have the spirit of God that dwells in you and you become a spiritual infant. I'm sharing this because if you're anything like me, I often beat myself up going, well, why am I not on the pinnacle and hearing your glory all the time? Like 99.9, I'm in the valley fighting devils. <laughs> and oftentimes, they're just the, my own thought process of how I've grown up and what's coming at me. And there have been times where I'm just like in the presence of the Lord and something will just yank me out immediately, you know? And it's not necessarily actually the majority of those things that yank me out of that presence are just normalcy, just total normalcy. Like, ah, oh, pee, a chicken will right when I'm in the presence with the Lord. What are those chickens doing? <laughs> I mean, I was just having this, pee. It's, it's just normalcy that will pull you out of that. So I want to go back to, to being in right standing with God. So it's the gospel of grace, but righteousness, trying to find this balance point. I'll give you some foundational scriptures that that uh, the Lord's put in my heart. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 34. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. 1534. That would be a good pin number for something. 1534. I'd like that. Um, very short scripture. Uh, it says, at least the first part of it, awake to righteousness and do not sin. So we're talking about righteousness. Say righteousness, right? It's so important, I believe, to be able to really get the flavor of, of the word, the flavor by breaking down the ingredients of what we're just reading, righteousness. It, 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 you can't draw from the nourishment if you don't have a depth of what it really means. So uh, I, I want to deal and, and remind, uh, deal with the word awake and, and then remind us again what, what that means. So this morning, all of you that I see here woke up out of your sleep. Um, that's as far as I'll go with this, this woke stuff, but um, <laughs> making sure you're awake. And, uh, but you, you, you woke up from sleep right? And, and now we're here at church. Uh, so we, 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 the, we became awake. It, right here, this, this word awake, I, I, I shared where it comes from, from the Greek, eknepho. Eknepho is the Greek word, eknepho. And what it means is, oh, this is so good. It says, to return to oneself from drunkenness, to become Sober. This is what awake means. Eknepho, the Greek, to return to oneself from drunkenness, to become sober. It gives a metaphor to return to soberness of mind. This is what I want to touch on. I shared a, a couple weeks ago that that drunkenness could be literal. I remember when my wife and I, when we first started dating, we used to see how high could we build up a pyramid of Coors Light cans after we beer bonged them. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. The trophies that we were trying to build in our life at that time are slightly different now. Uh, more than slightly. <laughs> we, we just, it was like, oh my God. And, and see, we did this knowing full well that the taller the trophy got, that pyramid of beer cans, the worse our physical and mental condition would get. But it's all in the name, right? Because you can talk about it on Monday morning. Hey, last weekend it was this high. This weekend... This thing was so big. We didn't talk about how bad we felt. So this, this, this can mean a, a, a literal drunkenness, but what I want you, want you to extract from here is that it's being under the influence of something other than your sober self, specifically as it pertains to yourself as a child of God walking together. So this awake it means 
Come to a place, return to a soberness of mind. Why is that important? I, I explained earlier that a lot of the things that yank us out of our spirit led or hearing the voice of God are just normal things. Oftentimes it's within our house. It's somebody beats us to the parking place before we had it. It's somebody, you know, having a bad day and they give you a look and it has nothing to do with you, but you receive the look like it did and you become offended. What's their problem? And all of a sudden, it's just like, you were just listening to, my wife, she shared this so many times, I should be listening to worship song in the car, just feeling the presence of God, and something would happen. She's like, oh, and her next statement would be like, oh, Lord, forgive me. Here I was just praising the Lord, and now I'm just speaking this crazy word over somebody or something else. Um, I, I, I've done that way more than I'd l like to admit, meaning speak something, you know, right when I was, Feel in the presence of God, and then I would speak something else. And sometimes, you know, I have this revelation. This is why, you know, I, I've shared before, as I've learned, words are seeds. This is why it's so important to get grounded in, in some of these words. Like when you want to awake, you need to come to soberness of mind, ekneifo, right? When some one of those things happens, because you get elevated. You're here. could be spiritual. could just be you're just having a good, normal day. And all of a sudden, something happens, boop, spike, you know, spike in emotion and anger, whatever it might be. Some, sometimes the, that emotion is actually exhilarating. There are people that are just absolute, they, they love the rush of dopamine or adrenaline that they get when they do something, when they get to the edge of something. Come on, all of you guys went to school with one of these people, right? It was that one guy or gal that just did something, Let, let's jump off this. And you're like, yeah. And they do it. We do crazy stuff. You think that bridge is high. Let's get, there's one around the other side of the lake that's 40 feet higher. Oh, it's like, wow, the people, the things that people do when they're under the influence. Bridge, jump. How many of you ever jumped off a bridge into the water? No, I have, many. Used to do it for fun. See, I always had this thing, even when I was younger, I wasn't led by the Spirit of the Lord, but there was, there was the, 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 um, the structure for who God wants you to be in your life and the pillars of how he created you are, are there at a young age, even though God may not be using them, right? So it's as you find God that he can use how you were you were defined. So I share this because there were certain things. I, I loved a little adventure when I was young, but there was always something that kept me like, for the most part, in balance. Like I knew that if I was going to go party and drink, I'm like, I sh I'm not going to drive, right? Because I, I, I mean, I grew up and there was a couple, there was a, a mentor in my life, uh, a father figure, if you will, uh, I, I, wa I was in the car multiple times when he got pulled over by, by the officers while he, was, while he wasn't so ekne-fo. <laughs> He's drunk, the cuffs. I'm like, wow. You know, and so there was something that was like, God, this isn't right. So if I would go and party and do stuff, I'd be like, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stay there. I wouldn't go too far, bridge jumping. I was like, oh, okay, we'll jump. But then I would get around people like my little brother who would be like, it didn't matter how high it was. I remember one time at a reservoir about an hour east of here, I, I was with my uncle. Uh, he was older. I was a teenager, mid-teens, and I was also with his father figure, and we were camping at this lake, and, you know, as tradition would have it, uh, you know, uh, we would maybe leave on a Thursday night or a Friday night, um, but typically within, you know, 16 hours, you know, an afternoon, a late night, and an early morning. Uh, all the supplies that they planned for for the weekend, specifically barley, beer, were gone. So we would go on this traditional beer run to this local town. Drunk as skunks. It just, they'd go, go to the town to go to the store to get more beer. And while we're there, let's, let's just go into this tavern right here. And I remember as a little, little guy, just, I'd just sit in the truck and wait. Oh, you're saying, it's just, that was our normal. I wasn't, I was, you know, didn't have video games back then. I was just happy. They'll be out in a few minutes. On the way back to the lake, this one time, my uncle uh, grew up in the streets of California, 
you know, enjoyed a little bit of nature, but wasn't real versed in, in a lot of these, these aspects. But I remember this one time, uh, I was old enough to drive, praise the Lord, but I had a few in me, and they were like, let's jump off that bridge as we were going over it. I'm like, let's not, because I know this bridge, this bridge was, this was really high off the wall. The, the lake had receded. The stream was just at a point where it backed up. There was no current. Um, certainly it was deep enough, uh, you know, maybe 15, 20 feet deep, but it was, it was very, very high. And they were not in their right minds, but I knew, I said, well, let, let's just, you know, they're like, hey, John, pull over. Let's just look. I'm like, oh, man. Even as I started to hit the brakes, I'm like, this, this is not good. I, I'm like, I know something's good. So we get out, and we start looking over, and it's like, whew, I grab a little rock. <laughs> oh, boy. And my uncle is not the light, but he was lit. I mean, just, I'm going to do it, man. And I'm like, oh. And, and, and this other father figure of mine, is, I mean, he starts taking his shoes off. And I'm like, this is not good. Something inside me said I needed to do this before them. You know, that may seem weird, but it was just like, I almost like I had to test what was going on. And that if I did it and saw, they saw how far it was and I could yell up from the bottom, you know, and I'm starting to measure this. Like, I need to jump. I can't get too far forward, too far backward, too far off to one side. I need to just, like, I need to hit this water straight. And so I kicked my shoes off, got to the edge, and they're like, you're going to do it? So I started to see that they had a little bit of doubt. And I'm like, okay, but I was committed. Off I go. And it was one of those jumps. I don't know if you've ever had one, but it's just like, you're in the air. Like, shh. So I'm like, whoa. It's like, you think thoughts. This is how long it felt. In the water I go, I hit it pretty straight. I, 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 you know, if there was a diving competition, there might have been some eights and some 9.9s that came up, you know. And I remember like whoosh, hitting that water and then curving under the water and feeling, okay, everything's okay, but that was, my heels stung, my feet stung, but nothing, everything else was okay. And I come up, and I'm just about to tell him, don't do this, and I hear wow. My uncle was right behind me, and he landed sideways, forward, splat. I mean, it was bad. And I saw these, these bubbles and these rings as I was just trying to recover, and I'm like, no head popping up in them. And this was bad. So I'm starting to kind of like catch my breath and go over there, and I reach down and grab him by the hair and pull him up, and he can't breathe. He's knocked the air out of him. I mean, I pulled him. You know, we swam just over to the side. I'm sharing all this because this, he was under severe influence of, yes, alcohol, but what that does is it makes your mind think that you can do things that you can't. That's what happens when you're not in a right state of mind. So when the scripture is talking to about awake, ekne fo, a soberness of mind to righteousness, and do not sin, that scripture says. Righteousness, I share that that's that Greek word, dikaiosune. And it literally means, in a broad sense, one that is in right standing with God. God doesn't want you to take unnecessary risks. This is why Jesus answered with the word when the devil put him on a high place and said, jump. And he used scripture, the devil did. And see if not, if, if, if God in heaven won't send his angels. He, is, he was quoting Psalm 91, but incorrectly. He left out part. It's like his angels have charge over you. So jump. But Jesus knew what was going on. He was like, you don't test the Lord. So see, when you are awakened and sober of mind to righteousness, the being in a state or condition that's acceptable to God, it'll keep you from sin, which is anything it could be the very smallest of thing and the very biggest of thing that uh, in terms of sin, that it's just not in the right standing. As human beings, I'll share again that we tend to categorize our, our, our sin. Well, I looked, but they touched, so I'm better. It's not how it works. It starts right here. And so having an understanding of, of allowing your mind to be in a sober place you know, when we have these peaks of emotion, highs, lows, that medium line across there is the balance point. 
And if we're hearing from the Lord, he can bring us to that. And it comes through being able to be in a condition or position of submission to him, that he can speak to us at that point. So once you spend time with the Lord, I love the psalmist in 119. It says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So we, you know, as, as you awaken and want to trust God, when you believe in Jesus Christ, the word is in there. But as spiritual infants in this new creation spiritually, majority of it is in seed form, meaning it hasn't, the word of God hasn't grown up and produced fruit. This is why Paul said, some of you by now, you should be preaching the gospel, but yet you're still on milk. What, what's happened? You forgot. He said, you should desire the pure milk of the word so that you could become mature. See, a child needs to be fed, but we're supposed to teach them. See, in an infancy stage, there's certain things they can't do, but it's amazing if you just challenge them enough. We've done this with our grandchildren. It's like, it, it, like <laughs> let them hold the bottle, you know, and their fingers don't even work, and they're, you know, doing this stuff. And, but, you know, pretty soon they kind of know what that, what that is. You see the first signs when the bottle comes, they're hungry, they go, right? And then you're holding it there and you're, you know, you feel like you're going to get carpal tunnel. Well, it's like, kid, when are you going to, you know? So you just put the weight of it and falls down. But eventually if you do that consistently enough in a close manner, they're going to start to learn how to do this. You get the picture. And then pretty soon they're just sticking a, you know, a fork in. Our boys, when they were, when they were, I mean, we had twins to start off with. It's like, how do you do that? I don't know. I don't remember. I have two grandchildren now. One of them is like, wow, how did we do that? But with, with them, I just remember putting them in high chairs, and we just throw food on the high chair, and they were just, ah, ah, ah. they ate with their hands for so long. Now, with the experience that I have, I started to teach Mateo, you know, when he was months old, how to use a fork. And that little boy knows how to use a fork and a spoon, way earlier than my boys did. Sorry, JJ. <laughs> but, you know, I say sorry, JJ, because they were just food all over. And we wouldn't even dress them. They would just be in underwear. My best friends would just say, oh, that's the underwear boys. Why? It wasn't because we didn't have other clothes. It's just because of how we fed them. They would just get it all over themselves. So it was easier to wipe their skin off than all these loads of laundry. And so this is what happens, and we begin to teach, teach, you know, our children stuff, and you just, gosh, you're under the weight of all this stuff, but with experience, I'm able to do something slightly different with my grandchildren, and it's fun. It's fun to watch how quickly they can learn. I mean, the intellect level of them is just amazing, so I'm sharing this because we cut ourselves short. Whoa, it's too late. I'm of this age. and We have decades under, our, under the, our age bracket. And it's just like, well, you know, I can't, I can't learn the things of the Lord. How, how, how much time are you spending to really get in the focused presence? See, the, the Bible asks such a powerful question in the book of Amos, chapter 3, verse 3. It's a question. Can two walk together lest they be agreed? See, Scripture says that keep feeding on the milk of the word and we'll become more mature. And, you know, I draw this analogy to natural food in a child because some of those children grow up and they're, they're like, Mark, my brother and Lord, your daughter, I mean, you said vote on these, these tacos that she, could, she can cook. Your wife, I've had her food. Woo! That just didn't happen overnight. The, the ingredient, why are you not 400 pounds? I don't get it. I mean, Debbie, she can cook. Oh, it's like, just like, oh. We, my wife and I were under the weather uh, earlier this, this winter. Mark drops off, here's the medicine. Oh, it was good. There was the cookies. That is why, I mean, it's just like you ate one and it was like explosion of flavor. The ingredients, that just didn't happen overnight. She had a desire to bake cookies, but it took time to, to get the temperature right. It took time to get the right amount of ingredients. And you know what else? Things change. Not all ovens are created evenly, or the same. You move from this house to that house, or in this house, you decide to get, go from, from gas to convection. 
you know, they can all le- read a certain temperature, 350 degrees, but they, they, the, the way that they cook and bake is differently. See, somebody with experience can discern in that. And this is how our walk can be with the Lord. But see, we're like, well, somebody changed the oven. We just read a scripture and that's it. And oh, for God so loved the world. I'm not mocking it. I'm just saying that's where we're at. We stay in this infancy stage, but it's by a choice. And so how can two walk together unless they be agreed is applicable to this. Be in agreement. The Lord said, all you have to do is believe. And how do you build up your belief? You believe that this is the authority, the final authority in your life. I made that decision. And because I made that decision in the presence of the Lord, whatever God says is the final authority, immediately there was things that came against that. But because I made that decision, I, it made me go to the word and kind of extract that. And see, without that kind of foundational decision, you'll just go on to the next thing. You just, you're like, well, that, that was too tough. Jesus said it this way. Some of you will be offended by the word and for the word's sake. And he was saying that because he is the word. Amen. See, people get, it's, 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 I read this devotional recently that talked about Ephesians 4, and it talked about the fivefold ministry and what it's there for, for the edifying of the saints, for the work of ministry, till we all come to the unity of faith. And this devotional that I read was so powerful because there is a division and a, a, a separation of religion. Baptists, you know, the, one of the very first things people ask me when, what church? You know, they'll ask me that. What church do you, you know, minister at? I tell them, they're listening. Is it uh, non-denominational? What denomination? See, people are already built up with their filtering, you know, Catholicism and blah, 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 all the different religions. But see, the scripture doesn't say that. It says till we come to the unity of faith, not to the unity of doctrine. Amen. See, there's different doctrines, Baptists, and even within that, it's like, hey, you need full immersion. None of this little bowl of trickling water on them. You need full immersion, right? They, they have these doctrines based on a spiritual truth, but there's measurements of it that can take people out of balance of who God is. It's the gospel of grace. It's unmerited, unrestrained love that we can have access to him at any time. It's about love. So it's a unity of faith. Faith in what? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. He is, oh, he's so loving. He's so bold. He's so funny. How do I know that? Well, I'm made in his image. <laughs> The Lord is funny. He's made me laugh at some of the times that I wouldn't have chosen laughter for myself. You're going to do this. I, I had a little giggle yesterday. This is a small, small thing, you know, that, that I had. And I, uh, a couple weeks back, my wife and I, uh, we decided we were going to go. We, went, we go to this particular store to get this particular type of food and you know, kind of a real bulk. It's, it's a better price, you know, and so uh, I, my son goes, hey, I'd like to go in on that so I don't have to buy that big old thing myself. We're like, sure, no problem. You know, well, I was going to go down. I'll take a look. So I go down there. And the price was like, it was like almost two and a half dollars more per pound than what we normally did. I'm like, ah, well, we need to get one. We're out. So I get that. And um, my son, you know, a couple, you know, just a few days ago was like, hey, um, do you guys still want to do that? And I'm like, yeah, we're, we're out of that again. And I'm like, well, he goes, I'd like to come pick some up tomorrow, which is today. And I'm thinking, oh, man, that's going to be that's gonna be expensive. I want him to get the majority. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go by faith. And I got in my vehicle, and I started to go to this place, and I started to pray, Lord, please let the price be, and I stopped. <laughs> I was like, in this natural realm, retail places set their ads whatever it's not like i'm it's going to be like you know x amount of dollars per pound i say the prayer and all of a sudden the whole management team before i get there (laughs) change the price of that for i've heard on high no god is a practical god and so I stopped that prayer, but see, I, I wanted to use my faith. And I, so I started to say uh, that prayer, I paused, but I'm like, 
you already saw this. You already saw this. I'm like, I am going to smile because this is what favor is like. God knew that it was on our, my heart to have this happen. I'm talking about food here, people, but this is how fun it can be walking with the Lord. I was like, wow. I started to drive and I'm like, the favor of the Lord. See, the Bible says in 1 John that as he was, Jesus, so are we in this world. The Bible says how Jesus was in this world, highly favored. Luke 2.52 says that he grew in favor with God and man. He grew in, in wisdom. I, it's like, so as he is, that's what we have access to, but we got to water that seed to produce that same fruit by faith. Faith confesses. Faith does something. Faith, this is why this is in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So if your faith is little, you get into Jesus, the word. Well, I don't know. I read these devotionals. Man. Go to a deeper place. How? Break it down. I'm not the first person that has looked up these words in a dictionary, cross reference the NLT, with the NIV and the New King James, and I can't stand it. I got to do the Michael Jackson PYT. You know, you got to, you, you just get in there. It's like, well, it takes time. Oh, you have it. You have, if you're anything like me, I mean, oh, I'll put hours into something. I mean, look at that video. Look at that video. Oh, man, I start learning. I was like, you have time. You do what you value. And sometimes you have to allow yourself, once you know what right is, to condition and discipline yourself to, to spend a little more time in that. And then the, the fruit of, of what you want can come to pass because you've watered it. So awake, get sober-minded. I don't have the time. Confess, I do have the time. You know, look at your screen time. Whether that's TV or whatever, you, you got it. You have it. And I'm not saying that in a condemning way. I'm just saying in a very practical way. And I want to tell you, Jesus is not condemning. He's joyful. He's just like, woo, he's just waiting. And you know what? He doesn't mind waiting because he is patience, which is unwavering. See, he exists in eternity. Time doesn't matter. We're so used to time. I don't have it. He doesn't matter. He's like, if you don't come to me at the age of 21, woo, it doesn't matter. Because 41 is just 20 years away, but that's just a blip. He's still waiting for you. He doesn't give up, shrug his shoulders and turn away from you. He's still there. This is his, it's just like the, how God operates. Oh my Lord, it's magnificent. So this is what it means, eknefo, awake. I mean, get sober-minded, learn about who the Lord is and what he wants to do for you. Amen. Good night, it's so good. The psalmist also says in Psalm 23, it's one of the best ones, the Lord is my shepherd. We love to say this. So many people know Psalm 23. He is my shepherd, I shall not want. See, you won't want if you're, if you, if, if, if you're not in the condition of lack, how could you, how could you be in a condition of want if, if lack is present? He's my shepherd, I shall not want. See how that goes together? The shepherd hears the voice, tells you what to do, so therefore you go get in a practical, natural realm based on a spiritual leading to do something that'll get you a, a natural manifestation of something here. That, that's how I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Soul. That's your will, your mind, your emotion. Again, awaken to soberness. Get into it. See, Jesus, Jesus said, this is Psalm 23. It's the word. And in, in Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28, Jesus said the same thing. I want to restore your soul. I want to give you rest for your soul. I want to put you in a peaceful place of thinking. Why? Because that's where great decisions, and that's how you can hear. That's that frequency that God is speaking at. He knows it's not that he's not speaking when you're in a super high or super low. It's just because of that emotion tied to it. It's the, by default that that's so loud that we cannot hear that, that voice. And this is why it's so good to get grounded and rooted in God's word and in his presence. So I want to read, uh, just, I'll just kind of cover real quickly here. Uh, how many of you have heard of Peter? 
I want to read three different places in Scripture about this man, Peter. I, I wish I had more time. It's, it's, it's so amazing. So uh, this is... Um, hmm. Wow, this is so good. This is uh, Peter. Well, Jesus is starting to be questioned. He's been taken into custody uh, by all the Jewish leaders. Uh, This is Mark chapter 14. This is about Peter, verse 69. And it says, A servant girl saw him, that was Peter, and began to say to those who stood by, This is one of them. But Peter denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean, and your speech shows it. The how he talked showed. Verse 71, Then Peter began to curse and swear and said, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the, crowed, the, the rooster crowed a second time. And then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. So we get so self-condemning, even when we have walked with Jesus. And this is why Peter, he's he's one of the many, many awesome examples of men and women in Scripture that we can draw from because they had this human nature. And this is exactly why Jesus came. He came down into a natural world as God, gave up his divine power that he could do things on his own, but yielded to the Father who told him what to say and what to do, and he did those out of obedience and changed things in a natural realm. And the reason this is so, this is so ministering to me, how, Peter, is because I've, I've been there. I've walked with Jesus, and you know, I've, I've literally denied him in, in, in ways that I've spoken and, and in actions that I've done. But there's hope. I'm going to go on here. After the resurrection, uh, John chapter 21, verse 2. And then it says, Simon Peter, Thomas called a twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Now, this is after Jesus was resurrected. He had showed himself to the, the people that would really believe and were excited, the women. But the dudes were like, hmm glazed over. And this is what was happening. Then Simon Peter said to all of them, I'm going fishing. And I first read that, I was like, yeah, when I was down and depressed, I would go fishing too. (laughs) It's therapy. But this was different. (laughs) What Peter was doing was going back to his lifestyle. See, all these these men that were listed here, they, they, they had a business. And so Jesus met them the first time when they were about their natural world business. Remember, he was, you know, when Jesus started his ministry filled with the Holy Spirit, he began to walk on the shores. He says, hey, you have any food? <coughs> like, nope. You know the miracles, the net-breaking catch of fish. It was, it was, he called them to be fishers of men. They began to walk with him, and then he died told him that was going to happen. In fact, he pointed to all scripture, you know, and all the prophets, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, there's prophesying about him, the son of man. Even at one point, Peter was like, no, far be it, Jesus. This is not going to happen. You're not going to die. Jesus like, get behind me, Satan. Peter wasn't Satan, but he was talking about that spirit. I got to fulfill my promise. So Peter knew. But yet after Jesus died, and then he heard the rumors of him rising again, he was in such a weakened state. He wasn't sober. And the power, and he's seen all these miracles. In fact, miracles at his hands when Jesus gave them power to go out. And he goes, I'm going back to what I was doing before. I'm going back to my old life. That's what what was happening here in, in, in in John chapter 21. I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we're going with you also. Then they went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night caught nothing. Hmm. (laughs) <laughs> we think we just go back to doing what we do because we know how to do it, but you're going to catch the same thing that you caught. Nothing. <laughs> doing things your own way. Nothing. When you go on to read in, in John 21, you're going to see that Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, before he ascends, comes to them again. Have you any food? No. We've toiled all night. 
and caught nothing. Again, why do I do the things that I wish I would not do? Why do I continue to do the things that are wrong? It's human nature. And this is such a beautiful depiction of that. Jesus comes, we know, at that point, and he restores Peter. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, why do you keep asking me? Feed my sheep, he restored him. He denied him three times. And let that imprint. And now I'm going to compare that to the Peter in the book of Acts. When you read chapters 2 through 5, you're going to see some powerful things happen with this man, Peter. Jesus had told him before he ascended, go into Jerusalem and tarry and wait for the Holy Spirit till power comes from on high. And when this Holy Spirit power came inside of him, this Peter was a completely different man. The Bible says, uh, oh, I wish I had time. But again, this is at the, I'm going to read in chapter 4, verse 12. Uh, this is at the coattail of Peter and John walking through the gates called Beautiful. And there was a man there from, from 40 years, from the time he was a child, that he, they would bring him there. And, and, and the, the man was asking for alms. And this is so interesting because Jesus walked through those same gates. So if that man was put there daily, Jesus saw him. This is how, this is how good God is, right? He knew Peter and John and, you know, would, would be going through this in the future. But now Peter, being filled with the Holy Spirit, begins to walk through and sees the same man. And the man, looking up at them, expecting to receive something, Scripture says, cries out to them, you know, alms. And Peter stops and looks and says, gold and silver, in essence, money I don't have, but what I do have is Jesus and he reached out his hand, and that miracle happened. And all of a sudden, these Pharisees and scribes and Jewish leaders thought they dealt with Jesus, but the power of the Lord was now in natural men who were once denying Jesus, but now filled with his power and speaking, hearing that frequency, awakened to righteousness, and they were able to do miraculous things. And this scripture in Acts 4 is on the coattails of all these things happening. And it says, Peter was, Peter was ministering, and he says, There is no salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is what Peter was ministering. Now, when they saw this, the, all these Jewish leaders and, and these scribes, they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men and they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. See, when you have the Lord in you, people will look at you and go, there's something different about that person. If this was different than the servant girl, they said, hey, we saw you with him. These people say, we see him in you. That was good. <laughs> we see him in you. But that was Peter. I'm going to go back to that question. How can two walk together lest they be agreed? See, we want the great things of God, but there comes a preparation of our spirit and our time to be able to get the goodness of him. Egg, frying pan. Frying pan on the stove. Crack the egg. Whew, you like it. Over easy, sunny side up. Those two things can meet together. If you don't apply temperature, prime that pan, that egg will look just like that. You can go Rocky Balboa style and do it raw. Heat up your pan of presence. So therefore, what you put into it that time, you're going to have something very nourishing. Very nourishing. Egg and pan. I bring that up because I've literally done that. My mind's going, so I'm multitasking. Put on the pan, walk away, like, okay, I'm going to get my coffee going over here and go over there. The egg looks, I forgot to turn on the stove. That's all you have to do. Just prepare. If you're anything like me, it'll be a little uncomfortable at first. You'll get up in the morning, I'm going to give some time to the Lord. Bing, email. Ooh, forgot to do that last night. Doop, the to-do list. And we multitask with the Lord. And we fit him in to our life. 
instead of making our life revolve around him. And God is so powerful. He's like a concentrate. But when you get just those few moments in, in, in that presence with him, it's wonderful. But I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's not going to come like that. You, you do have to warm that pan up. See, that temperature has to get to a certain degree before it starts changing material properties of that egg. Similarly, your spirit, wouldn't it be great if you could just push a button, ah, filled with the Holy Ghost, all the answers of heaven, right? No, you got, you got to prime your pan. You got, to get, you got to get warmed up. Worship is powerful. Praising the Lord is powerful. Using your faith is powerful. But, but it's just getting into that presence and warming yourself up. I hope you got something from that. I, I, it ministered to me, um, and I need it. You know, I can be, yeah, I, I need it. Thank the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Right, we're going to, I'm going to give you an opportunity because I'm prodded by the Lord uh, to, to um, sow spiritual, uh, a spiritual seed in a, in a, that, that can meet your need. And, and, and the act of doing this is, this is a form of worship, praising the Lord, is, is, is sowing finances into his kingdom. It's, it's a powerful thing. I mean, it's so powerful. I, it, it just amazes me how many times it happens in my, in my life that just that law, spiritual law of sowing and reaping. I'm not going to say a bunch more about that. This, this is an opportunity for you to really seek the Lord in this particular area, but I, I'm going to pray over your seed. Father, I thank you that as you put on our hearts to sow into your kingdom, we know what the word of God says. I've said it so many times that you will open up for us the windows of heaven and pour out such blessing that there's room enough, there won't be room enough to receive. And that it comes with the power that you work on our behalf. And the word says that you will rebuke the devourer that is the enemy and the forces of evil against us. You will rebuke that power for our sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruit of your vine. In Jesus' name, amen.